in this episode. You always think of it as like a calorie game. So the most frustrating thing as trainers for high school athletes is talking with them and saying, hey, you need to gain weight. A month goes down the road, two months go down the road, and then we see them the next year and they still look the same. And you're like, I told you to gain weight. And he's well, like, coach, I try. I eat all the time, but I'm not gaining any weight. If you're, you're serious about your nutrition and you can get a plan and you can follow it, you should get results. If you're if you're if you're going to the gym, you're breaking down muscle fiber, you're rebuilding it by replenishing with carbs and protein, you should grow. What's your thoughts on energy drinks? We are so we don't even realize how bad we feel that we, yeah. we think it's normal to drink energy drinks at 15 or 16. Yeah. That's not normal. <laughs> how are those conversations go when you talk about character with the other parents? I, I constantly talk about, you know, creating captains over MVPs, right? Like, I don't think our job coaching eight and nine you is to create the next Derek Jeter. But like, I would feel that we did our job as coaches that when we, we hand these kids off at 14 to either a Tigers coach or high school or college, like, that coach looks at that kid and says, somebody got their teeth into this mm-hmm. kid and did a really good job. Hey guys, in this episode, we have two guests, Jillian and Jason Tedesco. Um, Jillian and Jason are coaches inside of the Rawlings Tigers. What's really interesting about them is that they live a fast paced lifestyle. They, um, Jillian owns her own business. Jason um, has a full time job and they are running a Tigers team um, inside of our organization here in St. Louis. I thought this was a great opportunity to talk about Jillian's background, which is um, nutrition, eating. We're, we're in that middle of the winter where we're trying to gain gain ground and get stronger for the season. Also, when we're, what, what about in season where the summer ends up being very hectic for us? How do we actually eat healthy where we're able to sustain energy and not crash and we're able to go the full eight weeks of the season? So we're going to dive into that topic before we jump into the conversation because when you listen to it, it's just going to jump right into um, us actually talking and getting into the topics. Jillian is the owner of Fit Flavors, which they have five locations here in St. Louis. They're working on their sixth. And what is Fit Flavors? Um, It is a restaurant that makes fresh prepared meals for healthy, conscious, busy people. All their menu items are nutritionally balanced. They're made with quality ingredients and ready to heat and eat. This is not an advertisement at all. We just really enjoy talking with her. She is a certified chef from La Le Cordon Bleu. She's a speaker, has her own podcast, and she has written, she just released her new book, Owning the Weight. She is a wife and a mother, and she is a Tiger coach. And then Jason is the head coach of their 9U squad. He has a full-time job, and I I just find it interesting that they have this busy lifestyle, Dave, and Mm -hmm. they're now running a 9U team, and they talk a lot about culture. They talk a lot about community. This conversation just went in so many different directions. I have the timestamps in the description, but I feel like this deserves your ears for the full episode. Yeah, it was a really cool conversation that went into a lot of different paths. And what what we can take away from this one, and you guys will hear through this episode, is the the genuine care behind their voices and why they do it and why it's so impactful to their lives. Whether that be the nutrition side of things or the the attention to detail and care and culture culture that they're trying to captivate with their team. And there's a lot of really neat takeaways from this episode that that can be applicable to, you know, our audience from a nutrition side, from a sports player development side, from a culture side, from really just being a, a really good human. So there was there's a lot of good good stuff. And they give you information for parents on how they handle Sal and Vincent, their their two boys, um, and how they handle their nutrition. Um, you'll be you'll be pleasantly surprised on what what her answer is and what his answer is. Um, the reason that I wanted to do this episode is I want to develop awareness around the importance of food for not just our athletes but our coaches. Players are struggling to gain weight. Teams lose momentum at the end of a long tournament weekend and into the summer. How can we get the most out of our bodies? And that's that's for coaches too because we're running those long days where we're going from uh, – late at night riding up, riding up the lineup to then going early morning and then trying to keep the same energy level with our kids and nutrition plays a huge factor in that and sleep plays a huge factor in that and they answer these 
questions. So I want to talk more about coaching with Jason and how he handles his job. And then also we're going to dive in a little bit deep on the business side with Jillian. I think um, a lot of those business minded people are coaches that are um, corporate 500 or they have their own business. I think they'll find her answers really interesting. So guys, thank you for being listeners. Thank you for um, following us. Um, please make sure that you subscribe to our channel. Give us a review. We review, we view that review system as a gauge of how we are doing. So the more reviews we have, whether it's good or it's bad, it gives us really good feedback on how we can develop this episode and uh, develop these episodes and move it forward. So, and guys, if you have any suggestions on guests, um, I'm, I'm open to it. This is not just our show. Um, we want to make sure that we're hitting on the right guests. If you think someone would be a really good fit for us, um, please reach out to me. My email is at uh, spiker at rawlingstigers.com or you can tweet at me at spiker helms. You can also tweet at Dave at David underscore Burkby. Enjoy this episode. you kind of gradually see their production levels go down. Now they get kind of a shot of energy for the summer a little bit because they're switching environments or in a different uniform around different players. So they kind of get a little boost there, but they really, more times than not, especially on the high school level, and I'm sure it's at the younger level too, it's just a war of attrition. Hmm. And they're not focusing on keeping up in the weight room, keeping up mm -hmm. with their nutrition, mm -hmm. keeping up with everything that goes into what mm -hmm. they, they built up. So what he's saying is, you know, now it's a real grind through mm -hmm. the June, July months where it's really hot. Yeah. You're playing a ton of games and they're just zombies mm. by mm. the wow. last like three weeks. Yeah. And those are really important weeks for a lot of those guys, too, especially as you get older into the recruiting cycle, which we yeah, talk sure. about. So, yeah. yeah and the, those energy levels, it's and I don't think it's just the bodies itself, just mentally. Like, wow. Um, I feel like it's a more stressful situation when you go from week one to week <clears> six <throat> and I have a feeling that it's not proper sleep, it's nutrition, mm -hmm. and then it's also not working out because the idea is like, oh, I'm playing a sport, I'm playing a game, I'm working out already. Mm. Mm -hmm. But baseball's not very, uh, what's, this, what's the best word? You're, you're not, not running gonna, all the time. Yeah, you're not <laughs> burning enough calories. <laughs> yeah. Like the, Manny Ramirez said it really well um, when he was coming back from his injury. I, I just remember this very vividly on ESPN when I was playing is that Manny Ramirez said it's different working out and then going and playing baseball. The soreness is completely different mm -hmm. and you have to do both. You have to work out and you have to be able to play a lot mm -hmm. of games so mm -hmm. that you get your feet under you. Mm -hmm. And when we were coaching this last summer, the first thing that guys would be eating is like Chick-fil-A mm -hmm. or Chipotle. Something easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something easy, something quick. McDonald's. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think I think one person went to um, like uh, four Culver. McChickens before yeah, a game. Culver's. And mm -hmm. so the nutrition just is not there. And then you first game in the morning is probably going to be your best game because everyone is probably going to load up on carbohydrates at the hotel. So they're going to have that quick energy boost. But then when you get into the second game, it's like, oh, done. let's just try to survive. And then you're saying by day three, like Sunday, come. No, it's off. Trash. Yeah. Championship it's gone. Game. There's no way. You're not surviving. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So like when you were saying all this stuff, like it just the environment changes, but like now they're in the summer. I mean, they're also out of school, so mm -hmm. they're probably staying up later. They're not getting the adequate amount of sleep that they need, you know, and then it goes into like discipline and like who's more structured with their lifestyle and their kids, you know, and it's, it's sometimes I feel like our kids going to be that discipline to carry their their sleep and their sure. eating and their fitness into the summer but you know? how do you how do you keep that how do you do structure like kids kids right. are the anti-structure right. right exactly I, I, they're, I mean, they're the rebels the right every day i mean i guess that's the differentiator <laughs> is the kids that are day. more structured are probably yeah. the ones that are for sure keeping it together and for sure and there are some that do yeah. that really well and yeah. they're you know, I mean, we, we try to promote that type of information, but it, it's That's it's a wall underrated. you have to break through mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. You have to, like you said, it's it's a war every day to break through that structure because right around the they're going to take the easy way out, out if they can. Yeah. And so I think a lot of times it's them seeing maybe their their buddy on the team who is disciplined with it, who does kind of understand. We had a couple of those players, and then all of a sudden his stats keep going through the roof throughout the year and. He's not slowing down. He's instead picking up because mm. the rest of his competition is going like this, and they start to wonder why. Mm. 
that's kind of what we end up seeing. But he's not, he's not on TikTok till two in the morning. <laughs> no, that that app is <clears throat> the killer of dreams, right there. <laughs> killer, but it's the killer it's, of dreams because if yeah. you go on that ballpark and you have four hours of sleep and you're facing ninety three, it's no no bueno. Mm -hmm. That's not wow. fun. Yeah, no, that's not fun. Yeah. Um, you guys are extremely busy. And how, how, what made you the decision to like jump in on a tiger team and mm. starting a tiger team? Um, so I actually started the team as a six year team, just rec team mm -hmm. yeah. in kindergarten. Um, I started it because when we, when we went to sign up for baseball, the team that we were going to get put on had like 14 or 15 players already. And I said to Jillian, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be on a six year team with 15 kids. Like they're right. going to get to play. So I just called Chesterfield Little League and I said, hey, can, can I start a team? And they were like, yeah, sure, start a team. So we put out a memo on Facebook and next thing I know, we had 10 or 12, how many, 12? <coughs> 11 or 12 kids from yeah. our kindergarten and we built a great 6 u team. And then um, had everyone and then, yeah, right uh, between the change from 8 to 9 u is when we decided to move to the Tigers Club. And are you are you saying like why would we start? Why in general? Okay, yeah. yeah. Why in general? Why, why in general? Yeah. Because, because, yeah. because here, here's yeah. my yeah. thought is like it's it is hard to find good coaches. It's really hard. It's really hard. Like yeah. I don't I don't know if if parents realize that, but it it is really hard. I could speak yeah. to this. I think I, I think you I knew what you guys were asking. He didn't he didn't really answer it. I think you know the conversation that we had is, you know, we're going to be going to practices. We're going to be mm -hmm. going to games and whenever they are. This was one way to kind of like dictate the schedule around our schedules, sure. you know, like he travels, I run, I run a business. So like if we had the team, we could, we could schedule the practices when we wanted that's, to. That's not my answer. My, my, <laughs> but, but, but that, that is, was helpful, you know, and like sure. being able to do that. And then also like, he, he's a very, very organized person. He's probably the more organized of the <laughs> two of us. I always say he's the house admin. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably. I just show up. <laughs> <laughs> I just show up. So I was like, it would, he, he likes the organization of this kind of stuff. And I think just our passion playing with the kids, it was just so much fun. I wanted, I, when he told me he wanted to do this, I was like, can I please do it with you? <laughs> because, you know, I played ball too. <clears> and <throat> I just, I wanted to play. I just wanted to be out there doing it as a form of like, just being a kid again, in a sense, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, to answer difference, I mean, I was very lucky growing up. Like I had great coaches. I played baseball. I played lacrosse. I played football. Like I can remember all my coaches. Like I had a really, really good experience with coaches as a kid. And um, you know, I just thought like when we had kids and they're growing up, figuring out like what sports they were going to play. Like, we just got lucky. Like both our boys are obsessed about baseball. Like knock on wood. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know, if I had the chance to <clears throat> to give back and do for kids what was done for me is that when I was younger, like. I'd be all into it. Mm -hmm. And I just viewed that as sort of an opportunity to like create an environment for 12 kids to hopefully provide some really good memories and some really good learning experiences for them. Um, personally, like I think my best attributes as a person are, are my patience and my positivity. And mm -hmm. if you've ever been around six and seven year old you boys <laughs> playing baseball, like that's what a lot of, that's you a lot need of. patience more than <clears throat> baseball skills probably at that age. And I have an enormous amount of patience and, uh, I think, you know, I'm just a very positive person overall, and I just wanted to give that to the kids. Yeah, I, we, were, we had a conversation with Devin Morgan, who's, a, who's at Driveline, which is a big baseball company, and he says a lot of people over-index on the skill side of things for, like, uh -huh. knowledge and stuff. Um, I, I think that for youth coaches, they, they over-index on that, and they under-index, like, what what he's saying, yeah. which is positivity and just being a, being a yeah. good person in front of you. You got to be kids. comfortable saying the same thing over and over. Sure. Yeah. Like right. you're saying it for the first time sure. with excitement because you're going to do it for six years. Yeah. Right. I think another so. thing too, um, he, he took a lot of pride in was like, he did a lot of research. He read some books. Sure. He was listening to podcasts. He had a friend who coached little league for what, 20 years. And like, mm -hmm. he was trying to do all the research that he could to be a little league coach. Cause we kind of walked in, we didn't know what we were doing, you know? I think that's awesome because I think <clears throat> what I hear more times than not from just talking to parents who aren't going to take that responsibility is they, they do look at it as a daunting task. I mean, it's you guys, are, so much you guys are busy. You have a business. You're full-time workers. I mean, you're constantly at the grind. And then what most people look at as a youth coach is this added-on giant responsibility, and they're like, I want nothing to do with it. I think with anything in life, whether it's your – your career or something like this, like 
if you enjoy doing it, it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. Like I've been very blessed in my career where <clears throat> I've been doing my job for 20 years. It's never felt like work once. And I can honestly say the same thing about baseball. Like I love the sport. I love seeing the enjoyment from the kids. It could be daunting <clears throat> to some people. That just means it's not mm -hmm. right for them. But for me, it just felt, it felt right. It feels, feels fine doing it. Did when you natural? I was just gonna say, when you're out there, like you can't be on your phone. So like it's, it's therapeutic in a way too. <laughs> yeah. You're not, you're not, you're no so present. You're so present out yeah. there, which I love. Yeah. Well, um, well, what we see too, cause I obviously don't coach at the youth level. I've, we oversee an organization, but I don't coach directly, but I hear it all the time about the experience level that you guys are giving to those young kids. And, and I, I view that as a really big responsibility huge. and a huge yeah. impact you're making on those kids' lives. And I can only imagine that, you know, being parents and going through the process, you saw a void and a need for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something where people are kind of running away from that responsibility. I, I'm, we're kind of, with this podcast, with what we do with the Tigers, I think we're trying to help people get more involved in it. Yeah. Because yeah, I, yeah. I think it's rewarding overall. Like the first time <clears throat> I head coached our high school team, 15U team, it's like they're just now getting out of youth baseball. At the end of that, la that year, it felt so rewarding. Like it felt like I got like had so much more energy for the for mm -hmm. the remainder of the year. And um, I think a lot of people don't realize that. Um, yeah, you're, you're going to spend a lot of time on it. There's going to be a lot of energy output. But at the end of the day, it's like we had that conversation before we started. Like kids, um, I just have a newborn, and it feels like I'm getting energy out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I, don't, I I feel so tired, <clears throat> but I'm still jacked up about being being here and trying to help you. <laughs> totally. So, are you you guys are former athletes, right? Mm -hmm. um, college, high school, just high school, high just school, high school. Yep. just high school. Mm -hmm. And then what sports did you play? Baseball, football, lacrosse. He bowled. Don't let him. Lie I to bowled you. too when I was younger. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing like wrong a, with that. Like yeah. A bowler. Yeah. Softball, basketball, volleyball. Okay. okay. I didn't play golf till I was 25. Oh, wow. Was yeah. that just a way to keep in the competition? That was a things? way to like. Spend time with me. Spend time with him. <laughs> I knew. I was like, you know, and I was not playing ball. So I was like, oh, this could be something maybe I could get good at. And then I just got sucked in. <laughs> yeah. It can do that. Oh, yeah. Describe healthy eating. Describe healthy eating. And where I'm going with this is yeah. the word healthy can go in so many different yeah. directions. Yeah. Um, like you can see a commercial. I, I saw. You're going to laugh at this. I saw a Coca-Cola commercial from 1964. <laughs> and it was a mom who was um, sewing a dress. And she was talking about how thin she was. And her secret sauce was Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> I saw ads from back in the like 30s and stuff. They were promoting sugar was helping you lose weight. Like, yeah, <laughs> I've seen that. And they used the word healthy. <laughs> so what does healthy mean to you? Yeah, so I was going to say that's kind of vague. And what does it mean to me yeah. or what do, what do I think it should mean? For, it's so individualized, you know, because if somebody has health issues or mm -hmm. certain goals, their, their plan for what they do needs to fit them. But my philosophy is very simple. I, I believe in like three things, quality food, in portion control, and balanced with all the macronutrients. And that's kind of how I built Fit Flavors. It's it's the philosophy of get the best quality product you can, how you source it, how you make it, uh, portion control it. So even if you are gonna have a little cheese or a little chocolate, it's still in portion control, and then balance the macronutrients. And the whole thing with the macronutrients is that's where it gets a little sciency. but like, when I get into the macros and the micronutrients is really fun because we're, we're watching the sodium, the sugar, the fiber, the fat, like the saturated fat, like all those things and making sure we know what's going to happen with the meal when it goes into your body. I feel like people don't value quality food as much. I don't, I don't think so either. And I think it's where your values lie, you know, and I think a lot of that could be mis un, miseducation, maybe not knowing enough about it, what it's doing to <clears throat> your body, how it's making you feel it, why it's impacting your sleep. Um, people have so many symptoms, I think that they live with because they don't even realize what it would be like not to have those symptoms. And a lot of times just eating better will clear up a lot of that. You mm -hmm. know, there's so many people walking around um, with gut problems and, you know, certain foods just exacerbate that and then a downward spiral of symptoms that they feel. I mean, either it's acid reflex, gas, upset stomach, skin problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find it, in, like I just find human nature interesting where someone will be mad, like 
argue with a price of like I'm going to a steakhouse, which is if you go to a really nice steakhouse, what is it going to be a plate like 50, 60 bucks? Yeah, at least. Mm-hmm. And then unless you're eating Wagyu, yeah, <laughs> but then they'll go to McDonald's and get a three dollar hamburger. Technically, it's <laughs> coming from the same animal, but the food, it, the food quality is totally yeah. different. But they're willing to say, I'm going to go buy a Tesla. And they value the car more than the food, which the food is going to help you actually sustain and actually live your life a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And your mindset's going to be a little bit clearer. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I, I, just, I just find that interesting. Do you have mm-hmm. any, like, any comments on that? I just go back to the, the, the lack of knowledge. I think if people realize, like <clears throat> you just said, you might think clearer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like they might not realize that the impact of food has on their, their mental focus or like – how well they're going to sleep due to their digestion and what is harder on their digestion. I think people just are misinformed with nutrition as, as a whole. And so we just look at food as like a dollar amount. What do you huh? think the starting point is? Like, is it, it, you just, cause I'm trying to think back of how I got involved with yeah. eating healthy. Yeah. I, for me, the same thing. I was just trying to figure it out and try to understand. And I had my own journey with nutrition. I, I started off and I got put down the wrong path and I did a little yo-yoing when I first started and it was just trying to follow fads to look a certain way with my diet and then realizing I didn't feel well Mm -hmm. and then I was like god I'm gonna have to really learn this stuff so just understanding basic nutrition and then understanding like when I was looking at food labels I was more concerned about the macros than I actually was the ingredients and so if it didn't say there was any sugar, but it could have sugar alcohols in it, like I would consume it and I wondered why I felt so bad. And I'm eating all this sugar alcohol and it was giving me gas and upset stomach and headaches. And so I started looking at where my food was coming from in the ingredient list and if I could see how many chemicals and processed things were in my food. And then I um, I started eating more quality foods. And that's when that's what was the biggest life changer for me. Do you think people default on brand like they see a brand and then they just start yeah so like um you can get really confused with marketing nowadays like when you go to the grocery store i mean like especially if you're in a rush and you maybe you don't know how to read labels you just see marketing and it'll say 100 percent natural or gluten-free and it'll put gluten-free on something Mm -hmm. that wouldn't typically be gluten anyways because people don't even know what gluten is so they just think i shouldn't eat it it's gluten-free this means it's good for me you know like so there's a way that marketers will put like buzzwords and like catchphrases on their products to draw a consumer in. And then if they have a really clean branded label, it can actually look healthier than it is. But you just have to read the labels. It's the fine print. Yeah, it's the ingredient list. It's really the ingredient <laughs> list first, then the macros, in my opinion. I <laughs> so explain macros real quick, because I'm, yeah, I'm sure probably, a lot of people, probably, everyone's probably like, a lot of people are, because I, yeah, I sure. for one, I, I had, I'd went on through the first form map with him about a year ago. Yeah. I had no idea. I was like, what is this macro thing you're yeah. talking about? dude? So I'd, macronutrient, all of that means is it's a fat, a carbohydrate or a protein. Those are all macronutrients and we need those to survive. There are micronutrients, which are all like your, your small vitamins and minerals. Like a micronutrient is sodium or potassium. C. D. Yeah, all that stuff. Micronutrients. All the alphabet letters. <laughs> the, yeah, there you go. Well, and and I when I first got introduced to it, I, I the way I used it was I never really understood, you know, you always think of it as like a calorie game. Right. Okay. Yep. And so I always looked at calories. Okay. And I was like, okay, well, if I go to the gym and my watch says yep. I burned 500 calories yep. and but this this meal cost me a thousand. I'm at a 500 deficit and, yeah. and whatever. So that, that's kind of how I thought about it. But Mac, the macro side of it kind of changed it for yeah. me. It kind of gamified it's it. It's a little bit more um, I detailed, guess, detailed, dialed in. It's a little bit more, I don't want to say high level because I don't want to scare people. But like sometimes when you're starting off, it can be a little overwhelming to just start tracking your macros. Sure. I mean, it's an all in kind of thing and it can be overwhelming because you're counting every single thing. I'm sitting across from Spiker. I mean, he's in phenomenal shape. So like for you, it is your lifestyle. You've always mm-hmm. done it. But for someone who's new coming in, I don't typically suggest that right off the bat. Like I'm like, do you even know what a carbohydrate is or how many different types of carbohydrates Bingo. there are? Because most people don't understand there's starchy carbs, fibrous carbs, and sugar carbs. 100%. And then sugar alcohols and then they're all digested different and they all they all create a different insulin response in your body as well so 
if you can get people to understand just basic stuff and then step up, I think that's more of like, I call it calculus of nutrition. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's counting macros. Um, and some people can jump right in. They're really good with numbers and yeah. they can start doing it. Um, so then what's your suggestion? What's your, what's the starting point? Like if I'm not counting macros, what's my starting point? Quality portion control and balance is a good <laughs> place to start just to get, get people started. Okay. So qual. Um, break that down for me. Open so quality is like where your food comes from, how it's prepared, like reading the ingredient list. Okay, that's quality. So if you can flip a food over and you start reading the ingredient list and you're like, okay, I know what all this stuff is or holy cow, this is really long. There's a bunch of preservatives. Oh, like a, whole food naturally sourced. Is that what yeah, you're I mean, well, if you read the, new, the ingredient list, you're going to see what is actually in the product you're consuming. I mean, if it's something that comes in a refrigerator, it's probably just that product, mm -hmm. you know, unless it's like a cheese or something. But like mm -hmm. once you go to the pantry, it's a processed food, okay? Mm -hmm. And now it is preserved to stay in your pantry. And some of processed foods, I mean, they're they're less, um, they're, how, how do you want to rephrase that? There are some foods in the pantry that are, that create more of a negative impact on mm -hmm. your body, mm -hmm. okay? You know, and some are more more processed than others. I love the example of like oatmeal. So it starts off as groat, then it goes to a steel cut oat, then it's a um, old fashioned rolled oat, then it's a quick oat, then it's an instant oat. And mm -hmm. the further and further along that oat gets processed, the faster and faster it digests in your body, and the more of the micronutrients are stripped from it, mm -hmm. and the macronutrients. So the less fiber, um, less just. It digests faster mm. in your body. It's not going to give you sustained energy. So much changes in the when food is processed. So understanding the quality of your food, I believe, is so important. Because when you can put whole food in your body, it's like putting medicine in your body. Yeah. When you put processed food in, it's like a foreign object, if you think about it. For I mean, sure. It's not the way God intended us to eat was a bunch of processed food, but it's everywhere these days. So your whole foods would be like um, chicken, steak, fish. Um, Rice, potatoes. Anything that's in a bag would, that you have to actually cook. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, and foods. typically it's a one ingredient food. I mean, like. So, well, if you, so I guess a good rule of thumb is if I look at the ingredients label and the ingredients list, list is, is, short. is short, Shorter. that's probably going to be a whole food. It's awesome. Yeah. That's what your body's going to put a baseball love. spin on it. Calories can be like uh, total pitch count and your mm -hmm. macros are like balls and strikes. Oh, that's a really good point. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like that. That's a really good point. So then, so then, so the first is quality. This is my opinion. So people understanding quality is important and valuing it. We'll yeah. have to pay and I, more. And yeah. I think everybody knows that one. I think deep down you understand the quality of the food you're. Yeah, but I don't at. think people are paying attention to it when they're making food choices. That's true. Okay, for sure. Or they wouldn't be eating well, from the gas station. Don't make as excuses. Much. You know. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, they yeah. they view it as like, I'm gonna. This is cheap. What's easy? What's this is cheap? What's this cheap, is easy. easy. I'm gonna pay for yeah. it. Yeah. Well, you're gonna pay for it too in the way you feel. Sure. 100%. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all, you know, it's, yeah. When should someone actually start? Do you recommend athletes like going into macros at all? Oh, totally. I mean, like, I'm not saying I'm against that. I'm just saying like my, our at general. At some point you should graduate to macros. If, if that's needed, if that's needed, you know, um, it, like I said, some people are very diligent and routine and they need that structure. Other people, it could be a reverse effect on them because it becomes so psychological and mental that mm -hmm. they get obsessive about counting their macros and now mm -hmm. they don't have the best relationship with food. And then you could walk down the fair lines of feeling um, resentment after you eat, self-sabotage, um, guilty, and then you start sneaking food. I mean, I could go <laughs> on and on about oh, how there's, there, that was me years ago. Wow. Yeah, I did not have a healthy relationship with food. I used to obsess about numbers. And when I let all that go and I just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on quality, portion control and balance, I can look at a plate and say, I know that's what I need and I'm good. You know, I don't count anything and I have never for years. Everybody's got to do what works for them, but I'm also not a numbers person. I think that's really important. I think everybody. So everybody is different. Different that, for that, sure. And you know what? And I plus I, we consume a lot of our products. I also like know easy. all the macros. <laughs> Got a whole like, field advantage. Spiker, I also know all this stuff in my head, so I don't need to count yeah. it. But somebody who doesn't, I mean, I have experience with this, so it's like I've done it enough. I know you probably done it enough. You know. I I know, but I I like seeing you, the number. Yeah, and that's good. But it works also, for you. also just the background. I was an economics major, okay. so <laughs> I do like to see the numbers. It shows me. Yeah that I'm actually doing something and I can always follow that blueprint. If I don't have that blueprint, yeah. then I'm kind of just like, 
I'm floating in the wind. Yeah. And not knowing so what it, to do. It's, it's good. Yeah. You like the structure. You like the discipline. Mm-hmm. So, and you found it has worked for you. Yes. Um, but th- the second thing I would say is like people understanding proper portions. Cause if you put the proper portion on your plate, um, and if you're training, you know, you need a double portion of carbohydrates or whatever. That's when you're going to, those macros will grow with your goals. So like you can bring them in. Odds are, is you need someone guiding you with macros, whether it's my fitness pal, I think you can put in yeah. your goals yep. and your weight and all that. And it'll give mm-hmm. you like, Here's what you're supposed to consume, you know, and being able to get it as close to that as you can, but then you got to be consistent with it, you know? Yep. Can you break down um, fats and carbohydrates? Because I think that gets a little lost sure. in the mud. Sure. So they're both sources of energy. Um, so fat has nine calories per gram, where carbo- carbohydrates only have four. Protein also has four calories per gram. So like when you eat a carb, it's it's burned off once you've burned four energy units that's good. That's good. Yes. Yep. Yep. Whereas fat is, is more than double. Okay. Um, the way your body breaks down fat, it's much slower. It's just more a compound molecule than a carbohydrate. But if you're eating a complex carbohydrate, that's more fibrous, it will break down slower. But once you get into those like more simple com- com- carbohydrates, they just, they digest so fast. As soon as they hit your tongue, they start breaking down to glucose. So, so would you say that this is a fair assessment? that carbohydrates are like putting leaves onto a fire and then fats are like putting twigs into a fire and then protein is like putting a log into a fire. (laughs) Kind of, I guess. Yes. I mean, it it really depends because also too, when you build a meal, like if you're eating one food by itself, that's one thing. But once you combine all the food together in a balanced meal and you're, you've got your, your protein, your fat and your carbohydrate, you are going to have sustained energy because you've got the right type of fuels. It's when we fuel with too many carbohydrates, the wrong type of carbohydrates, it just leaves us feeling bleh. And your body can only process so much at one time. So if you don't need it or use it right then and you don't have anywhere to store it, your body will convert it to body fat. So then here's the question for players then. Do I want to load up on carbs or do I, or is it still a balanced meal? Um, Again, it's so specific. I mean, I'd have to know the player, know mm-hmm. their goal, know their weight. Mm. You know, there's so much. Are they working out? Like, there's. I I don't want to like put anything on here. There's that, no blueprint, right? There there isn't. But for the most part, if you're eating a balanced diet plan all the time and you're feeling good, that's a good sign. But if you're trying to lose weight, you know, maybe you watch what you're consuming and you make sure you're not eating super super large portions but if you're trying to gain weight you might need to be consuming more fat more protein or more carbohydrates and this is where like working with a registered dietitian would come in i don't do like diets for people because it's a little over my pay grade well and and let's go down just the this a player and coach kind of route because that's that's a vast majority of our audience anyhow So I think about this conversation, and from a coaching standpoint, I think the coaches are obviously they're, they're being pressed, a lot of energy being used, where it's in practice, a season, coaching, whatnot. They want sustained energy throughout that, right? Mm-hmm. A player has specific goals on the field. They want to obviously see their stats, their power increase, their yeah. velocity increase, their speed increase. They want to see the development process continue. But I think that at least, and I'll, I'll speak from the coaching standpoint, from by myself. I have no idea about nutrition. Yeah. I am very, very basic with it. And I played college sports, which is kind of crazy. I didn't get taught much then. It was more like, okay, you worked out. Now drink a protein shake. They didn't really tell you why, but you're supposed yeah. to do that. Yeah. And then, you know, you eat relatively well, but, you know, you're a college kid. And they didn't tell you the, the negatives of, well, putting this in your body is going to make you feel this way and that's going to detract on the field. And certainly high school athletes and I would assume younger athletes for sure have no basic knowledge right. of nutrition right. at all whatsoever. It takes a back seat. They don't even understand they don't even understand the ramifications of putting a Big Mac in your body yeah. and how that's going to make you feel. I mean, they have nothing. It takes it takes a back seat and what's weird about college sports is that you have a bunch of Lambos in the clubhouse and then you're feeding them unleaded gasoline. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. That that doesn't make any sense, mm-hmm. and, and I, I was in the same boat. Missouri yeah. State didn't do that, do any of that. Like we had, like we could consult with somebody, but it wasn't to the extent of like actual knowledge and like because you have to learn it. It's a day in day out process. It's uh, more of like a classroom setting than anything else. I read a I read a book written by, um, gosh, the trainer of um, Michael Jordan, 
Uh, Grover? Oh, Grover. Tim Grover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tim Grover. And he was just talking about how Jordan used to like love to eat a steak before he played. And everybody was like, oh, that's not right. But he was like, Jordan feels great on the steak, right. you know? And it was like, you got to find what works for you. And that was his like pregame thing was he ate a steak. And I thought that was so cool. So, but like back to what you were saying before, I think a coach would feel great if they just ate a well balanced mm-hmm. meal. And not necessarily before, but like, two meals before like getting that energy sure. into your body and like someone who's going to be playing in the heat like an athlete they might need more carbohydrates that fast burning energy before they're playing a game so how do you how do you start that conversation because i most young athletes don't want to hear that i mean they don't they don't like if you start talking about nutrition it most almost athletes, starts you mean most coaches too most coaches for <laughs> sure yeah. and yeah i mean i just think like why wouldn't you want to have every advantage over your com- competition that's where it has to start i mean like i can't wait to teach our boys about nutrition like they're just too young now to yeah. grasp it um, i'm trying to work with the parents right now we've just kind of like getting them tapped in a little bit with fit flavors how's that worked I'd, I'd love to hear that how are uh, those conversations going yeah so we like one of our last tournaments just gave everybody a gift card to get them in there to get their kids some meals before the game to get them fueled up just so they before could the weekend. Ex- expose themselves to like what balanced nutrition looks like and And then, you know, just having conversations with the parents when I can, you know, one-off conversations. But I envision, you know, maybe when they're a little older, it's probably having like a sit down, almost like meeting and talking about it with them and teaching them. I want to show them like categorize foods like proteins, carbs, fats, and vegetables like in categories and show them like this is what happens when you eat this. This is the type of Mm -hmm. energy and result that you will get. And I bet you anything in those conversations with those parents, I bet you you hear stuff like, well, we're just too busy to do that. Or we're there's no way we can cook a 50-minute meal. We have no time. But that that's where it comes down to like you have to be willing to spend for for that quality food. Here's an example. Like we were on a road trip. What did I always do? I was always no, looking for the restaurant, yes. right? I was looking yeah. for the quality <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. I wasn't looking for like, let's for sure. go to- You're like, oh, can I find something clean there? Yeah, yeah. something clean or something I, like, it has to be clean, it has to be good. Yeah. I, I'm not going to go to a, a clean place that is God awful food. I'm just not going to do it. Like but, I like I like my food to taste good. Yeah, you want to try to eat, you want to try to avoid fried food and just, yeah. do, I mean, just yeah. eat a protein, a starch and a vegetable. Like I think people overthink it. For sure. It's that's really, that's where I go back to like basic nutrition versus calculus is like when you look at your plate, you should see a lean protein, which is typically steak, chicken, turkey burger, uh, fish, nothing fried and battered. And then like a, a rice or a potato or even us, if you're going to do a sandwich, you're going to have processed bread, but that could be your starch. And then some type of vegetable or even a fruit for a kid would be fine. They're sure. super active. But putting that whole food into them, that's going to be full of m- those micronutrients. Yeah. And that's what and that's what I'm getting at. I think that most parents, most players think that this is some crazy calculus equation. Yeah. They think it's so hard. I did. They think it's really, really complicated. They think that it's overwhelming. It's a task that like I have to spend all day, every day involved in it. And they don't understand. I'm speaking for myself. They don't understand how simple it actually can be, mm-hmm. how it doesn't take all that time. It makes its conscious choices over and over. Mm-hmm. But there's so many things. In, and that's why I think like with Fifth Flavors, when we sat down the first couple of times and, and talked, especially about your company, I think that you talk to the normal person really well. Where you don't try to sit on a on a pedestal up here saying this is this is the only way and this is how you do yeah. it. I think you make it really simple in terms of good food, good quality portion. Like you can do this. Convenient people yeah. can yeah. do this. Like I think of pasta is like a great example. Kids love pasta. Everybody knows how to cook pasta, but it's white and it's processed. Yeah, there is whole wheat pasta. There's uh, what is it? Lentil pasta, those might be terrible. better for you. But yeah, they're <laughs> terrible. Yeah, terrible. So like I would say, if you want to eat white processed pasta, like pair it with a steak or a chicken mm-hmm. or something and put some like red sauce on it. Don't smother it in like Alfredo sauce and then salad or broccoli. Like right. you've just taken a pasta that you know your kid is going to eat. Give it to them in a, a reasonable portion, but put a protein and a vegetable with it. And now you've got a balanced meal. Like it doesn't have to be this perfectly cooked sweet potato every single time. Like that's not realistic and sustainable for a family or a kid. Right. You know, like we have to learn how to bend if we're going to do this for the next 20 years with our kids. You know what I mean? So that's where it's like, what's realistic and what's not? No, a hundred percent. And then, I mean, even in our conversations, you're like, I think you, 
You used the term 80-20, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And I'd love for you to explain that yeah. because that hit home really well. Thanks. So that's the other part of our philosophy. So with quality, portion control and balance is the 80-20 mentality. So it's like the 80% really stands for like 80% of the time I know I'm eating stuff that that is going to help me reach my goals. It's good, clean food for my body. The other 20%, well, that's life. Or that's when I'm opting in to have cake, maybe a tequila, mm-hmm. or just right. the oh shit moment where I'm grabbing right. something that I I, I, know I probably shouldn't eat. But you know, if you can do that 80-20, and I have found over the years, that is so much better than what the general population can sustain they will see results on that and most people can sustain that and then there's your elite people who can probably be more strict than that but that's not the general population and i don't think it's ever a good idea to get a kid in its head their head about dieting 100 at a young age it's more about how are we going to fuel your body like let's put whole food in your body let's make sure you're eating balance and getting kids eating fruits veggies and protein like at what point does it come where they have to have discipline where you actually start teaching that I think that I think they're going to opt in when they're teenagers. At one point, they're going to decide either they want they want to perform better and they they care about those things or they don't. I, I see it when I go to the gym. I, I see agree. these kids there, and I'm like, dude, this kid's probably 16. You know, he's there at 6 a.m. before school. Like he's opted in. It's yeah. his parents aren't forcing him to go. You know, there's going to be those kids that opt in, and I don't know what makes them opt in. I mean, can you? I think as, as parents or a coach, like the more you can lead by example. Like yeah. the analogy I give, like if you if you drive in a car with your kids in the back seat from the age of zero to fifteen, and you text when you drive, right? They're gonna text. And, and then drive. you buy your kid a car at sixteen. Mm-hmm. You drive with them, like, hey, like, why are you texting and driving? Well, I've been watching you do it for fifteen years. Mm-hmm. Like, this is not. So our our theory is like, you're gonna if you're gonna educate somebody to do something a certain way, like you should probably be doing it yourself rational thinking right um and then i think as far as getting through with kids i mean if you could if you could find athletes that are public about the way they eat and sort of highlight that like they're always looking at those people for sure idolizing them and if you can sort of walk them through like their lifestyle and what they've done and how they eat a certain way more chance of getting buy-in but we try to lead by example so it's creating an environment yeah like this is just what we do this is how it is so then that, that that leads to the question of like how do you do that with the team well, you know, we, we sponsor the team through Fit Flavors, and, you know, they're eight right now, yeah. right? So we choose our battle. I think they're a little young. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like, like she, she thinks our kids, you know, eat poorly, and I'm like, dude, our kids eat salmon, chicken, rice, broccoli, right. like, mm-hmm. multiple days a week. Like, they are eating they really eat so much well. much sugar. But, like, you know, her expectations are probably a, a little bit higher, but, you know, we just constantly – we try to not make it that big of a deal and just make it sort of like a normalized. It's not daunting. Like sure. When it starts to sure. become like a task and you're like telling them they have to do like, it just goes sideways. But if you yeah. just like more matter of fact, like, hey, this is this is what we eat and what we do. And another thing too is like I I let them eat a lot of sugar. I do because I don't want to be that mom that doesn't allow them and then yeah. they don't Well, it's know. almost forcing versus making them Correct. buy in. Yeah, yeah. and also yeah. too yeah. like I'm so proud of Sal. Like sometimes he's like, no, I'm good on dessert or he'll, he'll eat a couple bites and he'll stop. And I think sometimes like if I didn't give that to him, would he just, in, in, just sure. stuff his face because he never gets it? He's so, like, seven. He eats a full muscle maker, which is 600. <laughs> it's two cups of rice and a, a chicken breast and a half. It's seven. Crushes the whole meal. We eat oh, it for geez. breakfast sometimes before school. It's awesome because I eat I eat the muscle maker I, almost every morning yeah. for breakfast. <laughs> and every morning, like I'll sit down, I'll be like, "Sally, you want breakfast?" He's like, "No," and then I'll make a muscle maker, and then he comes and sits on my lap and eats mine. And then I have to go send That's to awesome. school. Then I eat one, and I'm like, "Why don't you just eat your own?" Like when I but like we're getting them there. You know like, what I mean? My kids don't love yeah. scrambled eggs, but they'll eat them on a Hawaiian bun. So it's kind of like, all right, so we're you're sacrificing. There's a, a give bit. and take, right? Yeah, yeah. With a little bit of jelly. It's a give and take yeah. and it's it's just staying but committed. That protein in not letting them bully school, you. So around, they're not just you know? eating like like I don't buy Lucky Charms. Yeah. I buy Cheerios. That's it. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm not bringing that. <laughs> we're not that's where that. I don't bend. <laughs> I go, it's the line have, is on the cereal. I go, yeah. it's it, it's got to have less than 10 grams of sugar in a serving. But I love I love that because I think that that like what you guys are doing and what you guys are doing starting those conversations with the families and your team, it, it's it's getting a base layer to it. It's just like making it welcome that this is out there and yeah. it's attainable and it's achievable. And I think that's like you know we we live in the world of high school baseball a lot because we see those athletes and just starting, 
just doing one thing yeah. is is so important because if you try to pitch them this complex situation of okay you got to count this you got to know that you got to do this you're you're gonna you're fighting dips yeah, yeah you're done but if you say if you can just do one thing for the next month mm-hmm. and just stay consistent with it and build that base layer and then all of a sudden okay then we'll add in this next thing then we'll add in the next thing and then by that time you're gonna really start to see your body start to do something different, mm-hmm. and you're gonna start to see your skill level improve at a rapid rate. And then you're gonna get so what I would think most players do, you get so addicted to f- like seeing your skill level go, 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 and feeling like you can just keep fighting every day. Mm-hmm. Well, then it's like it's habit. Mm-hmm. Another thing I we I I try to do like in a gentle way is like when the kids will eat like say cupcakes or ice cream and they'll be like oh my stomach i'll be like babe you just ate a ton of sugar Mm -hmm. i just try to help them make bring it to their attention attention a connection that like you don't feel good because you just crushed like sure a bunch of cake 40 grams of sugar yeah just just knowing that or like before they before we got a game i'm like hey buddy you're gonna fuel up you got a game today what are you gonna eat he's like i know something good for me you know so just like that he's starting to realize i need I'm going to play a sport. I'm not going to drink soda or anything before I go play a game. You but know? then at the same time, okay, he goes through that situation. And he's properly fueled, and he has a great game. He felt great the whole time. And then there's that, you know, after game. So did you get it? Yeah. You see kind of why you did that? And and then it's it, it you know, it keeps confirming why they should continue with that process, mm-hmm. which, again, is is the the end part of that process, I think, from a, from mm-hmm. a coach or parent standpoint. I think just continue. Sure. Um, I want to talk a little bit more on the youth side, but I want to dive back into high school. Youth parents, youth, youth players are going to be traveling to these events in the summer. Mm-hmm. What's the hack? So, I mean, I'm just going to do it as if we were going. If we were yeah. going to go and we were going to be out of town, I would be like, where are we staying? Is there a, a refrigerator in our hotel? Like, let's take some meals with us. Let's just pack the Fit Flavors meals, take a couple of them with us. And then, like, we would probably make stuff to, like, pack sandwiches to take to the game so we're not eating the concession food, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, maybe you let them get one meal or something, like, throughout the weekend. But, like, you can't – I wouldn't want them eating that stuff in between games and drinking slushies and stuff, you know? So just making sure we have enough water for them and – or we've even started giving our kids the nuns. Have you seen those? Mm. They're like electrolyte boosters, like in the summer when it gets really hot. Mm. So it gives them a little flavor in their water, but it doesn't have any dyes in it or sugar in it. It's just electrolytes. And so no so Gatorade good. or anything like that? Yeah. No I powder. mean, occasionally we'll, we'll let them have it again. Like yep. I don't make really any hard, hard rules, but yep. I don't want them drinking a ton of Gatorade. Yep. So let's just say I don't. you don't have that option where you just forget that you don't have time to make meals. You don't mm-hmm. have time to mm-hmm. – you don't, you don't have a refrigerator – what do you do? We would probably go to the grocery store and pick something up and pack a cooler. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, like I'm I'm psycho, so I would find a way to make sure we had at least one healthy <laughs> meal for the day, or yeah. we'd find a healthy restaurant the best we could when sure. we were out of town. So if I pinned you down and said you have to eat at restaurants, you would just make sure would, that you'd we would make p- it work. You'd make it work. We'd make it work. So no fast food joints whatsoever. We 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 don't we don't eat like that. So no Chipotle, no nothing. So Chipotle we would eat at. Typically you can get chicken thigh there and rice. You just again mm-hmm. you watch the portions. Like yep. I'm not gonna overeat there. I would typically get like the veggies with the salad and yeah, stuff. Yeah. But like um my kids, I want them to load up on the rice and get the carbs and replenish and stuff like that. But I mean, I would say Chipotle is probably one of the better fast food options out there. I think some of you said that was really important in that conversation is the preparation side of it, is is looking ahead. And like I'll give you an Takes example. Work. That exactly. Takes work. And I'll give you an example. And I think this is the most crazy thing in the world. Like for last year, we had seventeen year olds who were looking to get recruited into college, and there are colleges coming out to watch these players play. And we had so many examples where let's say we have a double header. And we had a pitcher who's throwing in game two, and he needs to fuel in between each game so he can have sustained energy throughout it. And where does he go? He goes right to the snack stand, and he gets nachos and a hot dog. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh, it's so And crazy. they do it all yeah. the time. And, you know what and, I, I, and I'm like, what are you doing, dude? The stands don't have better food. Yeah. 
I was actually talking to. I should open a concession. So I was actually talking to um, one of my friends who is a higher up at sports facilities, which they have multiple facilities throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Like they run the big, like Elizabeth town is one of them that he helps run that. And I was trying to convince him to do something with first form to get better, at least something like a level one bar or something like that. Um, I don't know where, if it's going to go anywhere, but, it seems like why why wouldn't you have that healthy choice or so um, it probably comes down to just food costs and money. Yeah, it becomes there, money it, for it the becomes, business becomes margins sure. yes, and everything like that we we played at this place um we played a tournament out in st peter's and like i was really surprised but they were like grilling their own burgers and i was like oh at least they're making them a but i mean who knows? <laughs> at least they're a little better <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're a little homemade you know so the most frustrating thing um as trainers for high school athletes is talking with them and saying, Hey, you need to gain weight and you need to Mm -hmm. gain weight faster Mm -hmm. and you Mm -hmm. need to get in the weight room more. Mm -hmm. And then a month goes down the road, two months go down the road. And then we see in the next year and they still look the same. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I told you to gain weight. He's like, coach, I try, I eat all the time, but I'm not gaining any weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. Is it, uh, is it BS or is it they're actually trying? Because again, I'd, I I would I'd want your expert opinion yeah. on this. Um, so I think that's where the macros really do come in, and then mm-hmm. like the, the natural body composition. I think some people are uh, prone to be endomorph, ectomorph, or mesomorph. So some people are just going to gain muscle more easy. Some going to carry weight, and some are just going to be thin. That's your just genetic makeup. And so those really thin people are going to have a harder time putting on muscle. But like that's why the plan and having the macros is so important for them because they can, it's just going to be a harder for them than say someone who's just more muscular. You know how some people's are, are just built like that, but that's where if you're, you're serious about your nutrition and you can get a plan and you can follow it, you should get results. If you're, if you're, if you're going to the gym, you're breaking down muscle fiber, you're rebuilding it by replenishing with carbs and protein, you should grow. I mean, that's science. So math. It's math, yes. So, so, part math. Math. so you're saying lie. part of it's BS, part of it is... Well, when the kids say we eat, I mean, eating empty calories and processed food is yeah. a lot of empty shit calories. And, and more times than not, you're not going to grow. It's but, just yeah. harder when you're just eating processed carbohydrates and not good proteins. And you ask yeah. them to break it down, because I've had this conversation a million times with, with young athletes, so I'm like, okay, well, tell me what you eat. And then they go through it and they're like, well, I have a, a smaller type of breakfast and then I have a snack here and this. And they don't even understand how much they're burning. Mm-hmm. They have no concept at all. So yeah. they think that because they're full in a couple meals a day and that they eat kind of like their friends or maybe a little bit more, that all of a sudden if I do that and weight lift a little bit, that I should just be boom, see ya. And they have no idea. And they're mm-hmm. probably at a calorie deficit anyhow. Mm. Yeah. They, they have no clue on that. Yeah. And they, especially a teenager, the metabolisms yeah. are just ripping. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. What do you? How much do you think they're burning? A day? Yeah, a day. I don't know. Two to two to twenty five hundred calories. Just maybe sitting more. there. Yeah, probably yeah. more. I don't sitting know. There. Depends yeah. on how big they are, but yeah. I don't know. I yeah. mean, what's an average meal? I mean, if, I'm assuming they're exercising yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. So that just puts it in perspective that you've got to put way more calories in when you're. That's where the macro side, I think, really yeah. is key, and that's yes. like yes. so when so something that I think would be really neat to talk to high school athletes is kind of gamify that is really put those numbers in front of them and say, you need this, this, and this, and this, and here's how you can get it, Mm -hmm. you know, and they don't, they don't know that stuff. I mean, even just watching them food journal for like two days and then looking at what they ate and talking to them about it is it's kind of like, I used to make my clients journal for just a couple days just so I could see Mm -hmm. what they were actually eating you know, and like I'd have women who would be trying to lose weight and they'd be eating like yogurts and like all these foods that were just like empty calories. They're just, they're, it's like a little, little lactose and fructose. It's like, mm-hmm. this is doing your body no good, even though it's a hundred calories, like eat a hundred calories of something that's good for you. That goes back to the marketing. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, that, Dan that and light or less. whatever. Yeah. yeah. Like, you it's just like a like, 100 and like, yeah, but it's like sugar. One hundred doesn't it's mean just anything. Sugar and <laughs> yuck. There's nothing in there that's helping your body. You know what I mean? Get, I mean, I guess you can eat Skittles and still be under a hundred calories. <laughs> you still get you meet those, 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 some people, like I said, that have those freak genetics that are just thin by nature. They can eat whatever they want and they're, they're thin. Mm-hmm. Those are going to be the people that are going to find it harder to gain weight. So let's talk about like more energy, gain lean muscle and um, peak athletic performance. Okay. So to gain lean muscle, you have to have protein, right? And you have like how much protein should one take? Yeah, I've, I've heard it range anywhere from 0. 0.7 to like one to one and a half grams per pound of body weight. So, so 
it ranges. So if you're at 100 pounds, you should be consuming at least 100 grams yeah, of protein? Yeah, it depends. I mean, 70 like to a, 100. Yeah, yeah, 70 to 100, 100 plus if you're trying to gain. I mean, and if you're not doing that, you're probably not gaining. Mm. No, probably not, you know. Well, more. I mean, if you're practicing an hour and a half, two hours a day mm -hmm. in the summer and weight training, like it could be more than one. And so I'm hearing everyone on the other line, 100 grams of protein, that's a lot of protein. How but do if I you're not eating you protein, weigh, you're eating you fat and carbs. Yeah, no. <laughs> da, da, da. <laughs> like, hello. <laughs> so like, it, like, I'm 194, so like, that's a lot of protein. 200 grams? Yeah, so like, how how do you fit to, I know how I do it, but yep. I, just, I, I, would, I would want you to. Okay, so if you're 200, if you weigh, let's just say 200 pounds, like three meals with 35 to 40 grams of protein is how much? 120. 120. Two protein shakes with two scoops is 80. Boom, you're there. So you, you're all in on supplements too. Oh, I mean, it's going to help you. I mean, maybe you're doing a protein shake there and then maybe the afternoon you eat another meal. Like we just eat meals. Like I like putting the whole food in my body mm -hmm. versus protein shake, mm -hmm. protein shake, protein. But they're great. It's a great way to like take a shaker with you on the road or like then there's the whole meal post-workout. Like after you work out, you have this window of opportunity where your muscles are like, feed me. And like mm -hmm. anything you eat just gets sucked up. It replenishes your glycogen stores. It's gonna get that protein back up in you. So if you're putting in 40 grams of protein and 40 grams of carbs post-workout, it's just a replenish. Replenish, and that's, then you can eat again. That's another thing that a lot of people don't think about is that I'm going to work out and do a bunch of cardio, and then I'm not going to feed myself after the cardio. Mm. Mm. I, I see a lot of kids do that where they don't. Oh, know why? Be be I, I think they don't realize that they have to feed themselves right after a workout, like even practices. So like you have to have a healthy amount of carbohydrates stored in your body to perform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was this like bucket theory, and it's like everybody's got a bucket, and they can hold so many carbohydrates in their bucket, and Let's just say that bucket holds, I don't know, 200 grams of carbs. I'm just making up a number. Well, there's four calories per gram. So that's 800. Is that 800 calories of stored energy your body can hold in your muscles or your liver? And so as you deplete your glycogen stores, you got to fill it back up to perform and have all that, that energy or you're going to start producing lactic acid and you're going to start, you're going to run out and your body's going to, you're going to feel groggy. So like if you're emptying your stores and you're not replenishing, you're, it's like you're a half empty gas tank. That's what happens with pitchers hangovers. So oh. do you know what the pitcher hangover is? No. So a pitcher hangover is, um, after they have a start. So let's just say a guy throws 75 pitches. So in those 75 pitches, let's just say 30% of those pitches are like high intent. So you're in high pressure situations, three, two count, two outs, guy on third, stuff like that, right? Mental energy. Yeah. So you, you're, you have, everything is being used at that point. After they pitch, they do not restore their body with the right nutri nutrition wow. and um, like water, yeah. protein, because, because it's not a one-to-one -one comparison of working out. Like they don't view it that way. Mm. They view it as like, oh, I just played a game. So like mm. more times than now you're told to go run. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> more times than now you're now told. That we, now that you say that after I, <laughs> I was a pitcher, I just threw a 90 right, pitch son, game. I'm worn out. Pitches. I'm exhausted. <laughs> Who tells you to run? Our coaches. Yeah. Oh yeah, is it for sure. For that was recovery. just the standard. That oh, was the old standard. Gotcha. So the standard yeah. was that you would go run right after you pitch. Yeah, like 30, 40 minutes. You're going to go run. You're going to go. Oh. It's the the stand. It was to clear the lactic acid. Yeah. Out. Okay. I've heard that before. And 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 then you're like really exhausted Toasted. at that point. <laughs> and you like I can tell you so many times where my brain didn't even function at that point. Like I wasn't thinking you're about. You're running on fumes. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about getting a protein shake or making a meal. I was like, dude, where's the nap? Where's the couch? Like, that's all I wanted to get to. And where's the soda? There's yeah, also, there's some, also, yeah. um, you know, if you went into that, that gas tank half full and that, you're going to feel For like, sure. it, like if you went in with a full gas tank and, and you're ready to go, you, you're probably going to perform better. Yeah. Then you fill it up. You're going to probably avoid that hangover. You know what I mean? It's just replenishing electrolytes. Like you said, water, um, and getting those good macros in there and, helping your body recover and your your i'm sure your arms are well oh I don't for know, sure our pitcher's arms yeah. sore oh yeah for after sure after uh, yeah for sure and i i think the really interesting thing because i kind of go back to when i was in college nobody talked about the timing of your meals mm. around a, around an athletic event no one talked about it. i mean we were when not a typical day for me when i was a division two pitcher so we didn't have the luxury of playing one game a day we'd play two on the weekends two on saturday two on sunday i would show up at the field at about 9 a.m. for a noon doubleheader, 
We would do field work, et cetera. I might have a breakfast before a little bit. I was never much of a breakfast yeah. eater. So if yeah. I could get a couple bananas in me or something like that, yeah. that was good. But then I would not eat until maybe in between games at three. Wow. And let's say I'm starting that second game. I mean, I'm starting at maybe half a tank. Mm. Wow. I didn't notice it because yeah, I was still those, young. Those but bananas, they just burn off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And But no one talked about timing. I yeah. think that discussion's happening a lot more at the professional and collegiate level and hopefully filtering down to where – Two hours before or whatever it is, you have to put this X amount in to have that type of performance output in your mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. And then as you're in the game, there are things that you can put in your body to sustain mm-hmm. and keep that flow going. Mm-hmm. And then right after, so you don't feel that crash, there's other certain things you can do. And then that's going to make you feel better the next day than oh, yeah. if you hadn't. Yeah. And that's a big conversation yeah. that I think a lot of athletes don't get told. Mm-hmm. That if they were told that exact type of like... Um, equation, if equation. you will, then they'd be like, wow, Sign this is up. a game changer. Yeah. I can specifically yeah. remember um, in high school going to away games and like, you know, we'd, I'd eat lunch. I don't even remember what I ate for lunch, but then I would get on the bus to go travel and I didn't have food. And like one of the moms would always bring us this big box of apples and bananas mm-hmm. and I was starving. So I'd eat two bananas and mm-hmm. an apple or two apples and two bananas. And by the time we would get there, I would feel so tired. Mm-hmm. I would just be like sleepy tired. Mm-hmm. And I know now I was having a sugar crash. Like I didn't have any protein and complex carbs. I was crushing sugar, even though it was fruit. Hey, but but there the- was I probably ate four pieces of something because I was so hungry after school before I went to play our softball games. And the mom probably thought that she was, was doing, doing you all a service. Yeah, it's sure, a healthy totally. food. But it, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like a bad, like she should have given us peanut butter, right. peanut butter crackers with our apples or something, you know? Yeah. Um, but so what's the ultimate pregame meal? I would say a balanced meal, definitely with good complex carbohydrates and protein. If you can get some veggies or fruit in there, great. what's the timing on it? Mm, you so know, honestly, let's just, say, let's just say it's a 12 o'clock game. I think if you could, if you could get two meals in before you play, that'd be awesome. And if you're not a big eater, I would say you need to get one meal in with you, you know, and then if you're hungry in the dugout, like even maybe having a protein shake in the dugout. So hour before you hit to pregame. Yeah, I mean, like, you don't want to go with a bunch of food on your stomach if that's going to upset you. Like, him and I both can crush food and go work out. Like, yeah. yeah. That's just us. But I you've mean, also probably built your body to do so. I mean, like. I think two hours before. Y- yeah, yeah. I, would, I would say if you're if you're not a person to eat and go act, activity, give your body some food, um, time to digest because all that blood is going to your stomach, mm-hmm. you know. But, like, I've, I, I can easily eat and go do something, you know. But everybody's different. But sure. I would say having that. It's more so like, have you p- properly fueled the like the night banana. before and the morning, <laughs> right. getting that bucket full, yep. you yep. know what I'm saying? Yep. Like loading up. It's like what you put in your body right now might help you not get lightheaded, but the fuel that you're running off is also what you ate for breakfast and the night before. Cause that's what's oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's going back. Cause that food is just in your belly. I mean, how fast are you going to digest some rice or potatoes? Like you need to have that food in your body. Mm. I would say, and have your stores up and loaded and ready to go. That's why it's an ongoing thing. Mm-hmm. Would you do a rapid assimilation protein at all? You mean like a like, like an a, isol, uh, isolate? Yeah, well, no, like something that hits your system a little bit faster. Like an Some, isolate. Yeah, so n- nothing that is slow digesting, but more like it's pretty quick. Sure. I mean, what you is could, that? Like an isolate. Versus I don't know what like that is. A, isolate is just a type of protein that doesn't have like as much what would you say casein in it and yeah. it just breaks down faster okay. the, the protein molecules break okay. down a lot quicker that so isolate's supposed to be really good post-workout so they say because it doesn't take time to digest it just right to your muscles with actually they say post-workout it's actually good to have some simple carbs because it helps transfer the uh, protein even quicker into mm. your system than say a complex carbohydrate so like what would you if you that's if, why you see bodybuilders drink like isolate and like sometimes like what is it mal, mal, i'm gonna say it wrong maltodextrin thank you that's a big word yeah <laughs> oh my God, I, just, I just got smarter it's just, just, a, hearing that. It's just, a, it's just a form of carbohydrate that's gonna digest quickly so it's just carrying it to your um muscles and replenishing the glycogen quicker what about like that's getting really sciencey though i think right. that's overthinking it like yeah. Just eat, just eat food after you work out. That's good yeah. for you. Yeah. What about like the healthy, healthy bars, like energy bars? Mm. You know, here's my thought on bars. Like Cliff bars yeah. Yeah. and all that. Yeah. They're great in a pinch. Don't make it your habit to eat that every single day. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. it's a processed food. 
Mm. Make your own bar. If you're driving between Kansas City and Wichita in the middle, <laughs> it's not a bad option. Right? <laughs> There's nothing there. Yeah. So what's so funny I is like I I I I've had fit flavors for how many years? And I feel like Jay really got on the fit flavors wagon several years ago and really got into eating the food consistently and he just really started seeing different results with his physique and he's like, holy cow, I didn't realize how much I was overeating at times or going mm. long periods of time without eating or eating cliff bars. He was eating too many. He's like, God, I would have a banana and two cliff bars for breakfast. So I was like, eh. now he eats chicken, broccoli, rice. I mean, he, d- he doesn't like to eat breakfast food, so he'll just eat chicken and rice, but it's, it's a balanced meal. So it's just sure. so much cleaner on the system. And it, it's such like with whole food, you're eating a large portion. Like you can eat chicken, broccoli and rice and it's less calories sometimes versus eating something processed. That's just full of maybe uh, saturated fat or a bunch of sugar where you're not going to get that when you eat whole food. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts on energy drinks? Um, I don't like them for kids. What, what age would you Probably 18 or 21 when they're adults. Like, God, don't get hooked on that stuff. Holy cow. They crush them. Yeah. So it, it, it's so a bad you, 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 You'd wish there was yeah. regulation on it. Oh, man. I just feel like, one, it probably makes you not hungry. And so they're probably eating less on them. It's giving mm-hmm. them this false sense of energy. Gets them off their natural circadian rhythm where they're probably wanting to stay up late. Then they're droggy for school. Like it, and Then they're drinking another one. Like I just think it's it's almost like, if you think about it, it's, it's like a little mini drug. You know, it's, it's I, uh, I just don't like any of that stuff. It, I'm thinking, why would you want to, yeah. if, if you needed one, I guess you could have one, but why not just drink like a cup of coffee? It was really funny. You're 17. You're 17. I know. They, they show up. <laughs> I also right? that That's trouble. the problem is <laughs> like, we are so, we don't even realize how it's bad true. we feel. That w- yeah. we think it's normal to drink energy drinks at 15 or 16. Yeah. That's not normal. <laughs> no. One of the guys I follow, he's in he's in finance, and he um, he tweeted out because he he lives in Puerto Rico. He's like, oh, I opted out for the uh, croissant, and I went in for the coffee. I'm so proud of myself. And then someone tweeted at him and said, Oh, you went with the drug instead of the food. Nice job. <laughs> he's like, Tip the hat. Good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I think we kind of get that false sense with the caffeine that it has, it's giving us energy, but it's actually just kind of delaying the inevitable. Yeah. And the more you yeah. drink it, the more, what is it, uh, tolerance that you build up. And then sure. you're just like loading Steep. stimulants in your body, which could have a reser- reverse effect if like you really get hooked on them. You could trash your adrenals, you know, and, and really have a... Eat a cup of rice, man. <laughs> just eat a cup of eat rice. A cup of rice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing you're not a fan of pre-workouts or anything like that. You know, everybody, you do you, boo. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I have my own... Look, I have. I just have my own set of values and standards for yep. my own body. And I would never poo-poo on anybody, but like I, I wouldn't want to put that stuff in my body. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sensitive to stimulants, but like, I know it helps a lot of people. If they just want to drink it before a workout and have a killer workout, great, you know, but it's that on all the energy drinks and all the stimulants, like just be careful, you know, that's all, especially with kids that makes me nervous, you know, but I, I, I don't feel like I need that, but you know, I know a lot. Do you feel like you get that from, from a balanced diet and from food? Yeah. I feel great when I go work out. I mean, I don't like working out at night. I'm not as energetic, but, um. Yeah, I don't know. I know I've done pre-workout before sure. and all that stuff. I've I've done it all. So, w- if I am addicted to caffeine and I can't get off of it, yeah. and I like caffeine. W- at what point should I stop taking caffeine Oof. in the day so that I'm able to get that sleep? Because a-, a lot of people undervalue sleep. Yeah, I would say probably like two, three two, o'clock. Yeah. Just cut it off. Um, you yeah, you probably want to, or if you had to cut it back, maybe cut back your portion and start cutting yourself back because you're going to get that like caffeine withdrawal. Yeah, I just looked at my watch. It's 347 and I have a coffee here. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about um, teams because yeah. you run a team with your business and then obviously Jason has his team. What, how big is the community aspect of your team and then how do you, how do you cultivate a good community around that? Could you, anyone? Want to go? Bueller. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've gotten really lucky with our team. Um, faith is a big thing for us. So when, when we put our team together, like we were pretty upfront and transparent with people that uh, the word and faith is important to us. And I think that just kind of naturally drew some people to our team that had kind of similar beliefs and mindsets and goals for how they want to raise their kids. 
Um, we try to do things outside of baseball with the kids as well. So That's one of cool. the things that uh, that I personally do is in the winter, I go watch all my boys play their other sports. Oh, I, go to, awesome. I go to their hockey games, I go to their basketball games, I go to their soccer games, and I just support them in the other stuff that they're doing. And uh, the parents, they say it goes like such a long way with the kids. Um, those are two things. We've I mean, had I don't some know, what uh, else? sleepovers at our house. Mm. Yeah, we do a team sleepover team. every year. <laughs> that was which chaos. 11, 10, <laughs> 11 <laughs> boys <laughs> sleeping over is, is interesting. I made them filet mignon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and right, she did. You don't yeah. hear that at a yeah. nine year sleepover yeah. very yeah. often. And you know what? They tear it up, too. <laughs> they tear it up. They do. <laughs> yeah, like, so. They're going to love me. <laughs> so I think, you know, just being involved in their lives outside of baseball helps build community inside of baseball, both For with the sure. kids and, I think and the families. The, the reason I asked the question is because it feels like we're kind of losing that a little bit just because of how big this world is now with the phones and the mm-hmm. iPads and the computers. Um, cause I remember back in my day, um, Catholic, I went to Catholic school and the community was so tight knit. Mm-hmm. It was extremely tight knit. Like everyone knew who everyone was. Um, people would support each other, go to, go to games. And like, these are people that don't even have a sports background sometimes and they'll come and hang out with you. Mm-hmm. Um, do you just start that from the very beginning? Like, do you just like say, Hey, these are, these are the values that we have and this is what we're going to do. And then whoever's not in, they just opt out and they just leave and you have that churn? Um, I wouldn't say anybody left, but people certainly sort of came. It was uh, when, we, it was when we started yeah. the select team. We kind of put yeah. out like, here's what we're doing. Here's yeah. what we're going to. Kind of planted your flag and said, here's, this what, is, here's how we're building we the team on, yeah. you know. Well, up front communication and here's the values yeah. that we yeah. believe yeah. in and here's that's how our cool team's going to be ran, and that, and which I think is really cool. important yeah. Yeah. because that, that could sit out in front and you do attract the people who want that because I think people – they don't more times than not. We talk about this on the podcast. I think a lot of parents get into team situations or clubs and they don't even, they don't even know what they're looking for and they're not asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where situations go awry a lot. Well, they chase the status, they chase the eliteness rather than the community aspect, which then Mm. gets you to for their kid. Yeah. Correct. Then gets you to the elite status, which a lot of people kind of don't realize is that like, if you kind of, switch the priorities from status and elite and put that under and put, I want to be close to a really good community and mm-hmm. really good people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The eliteness ends up coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think we've talked about, you know, just like I always, I'm big on visualization. Like mm-hmm. I visualize a lot. hundred uh, percent. I have a whole chapter in my book about visualization and the power of it. And I visualize what it's going to be like with these boys like 13, 14, and then seeing them in high school. And like, I just picture them at my house and I picture feeding them and I picture him like mentoring them as Mm -hmm. boys and men because like they find him as like a safe place. Like I see this in my head. How detailed do you get? Really detailed, detailed. uh, enough detailed to like picture them, what I'm feeding them and them in my house, throwing a football in my living room. Like I can see this and I'm like, you know, we're just creating this safe space that's fun and lighthearted, but you know, we trust coach Jason. And then it's like an opportunity to create like a platform for them to, to, to ask us questions and, and build trust. And like the only way we're going to get that trust at 16, 17 is if we put in the time now. Mm -hmm. So like, I look at this as like the long game. And so I say that to him all the time. Like the long game is putting in the time now with the family dinners around the table. So when they're 12, 13 and 14, they are, we're, we've already been eating family dinners at the table. It's, it's just normal. And then we have this platform of 30 minutes of open conversation with our boys where, now we can have a talk about what's going on in their life. Yeah. Well, then it just opens up everything. Yeah. And you realize what's actually happening. Yeah. And I hope, you know, like. We did something over the summer where, you know, we, we started this team with um, six players from our old team. And then we went to the Tigers mm-hmm. tryout to kind of fill it out. So I, <clears throat> I told the six boys that were with us for the past four years, like, you know, you guys have a big job here. Like, there's going to be kids coming in that they don't know you. So, like, you need to make them feel welcome and like their family and like they're your team from day one. I told them, I don't want like two groups, right? Like I want there to be one group and that's not my job. Like that's your job on the field, in the drills. Like don't exclude anybody. Like don't play catch with one of the six guys in the warm up that you know, like play catch with somebody you don't know. So what we did this summer when we got the team together, we threw a big pool party 
and invited everyone out, and the parents got to like sit awesome. poolside and have a beer, culture, right? Off and the like band. meet the parents, and like so that when they show up to the first game, like you're not showing up. There's to no like, clicks. There's no strangers. Like we all just had beers by the pool. The kids jumped off the diving board for five hours, and like we're good. Everyone's on the same page right now, and I think that really helped like the team kind of like yeah. come together like yeah. really really quick. That Makes you awesome. feel like a family. It's not. Yeah, it's not time. a. It's not yeah. individuals. It's totally. a family. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So you view it as a full year thing. You don't view it as totally six months or five months. No. Oh, the, I, this no. is like one of our life commitments right now. Yeah, I no, say. I'm all in. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. I've totally. never heard it said that way. I I'm so like proud that. to say I'm a Tigers coach. It's <laughs> that's of, awesome. It's part of our life and routine. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you do it with your business? Um, because you have how many locations? I don't want to. I don't want to butcher the locations because I know you guys yeah. are expanding. Yeah. Like, what, so we have five right now. We're yeah. opening our sixth. Okay. Yeah. And that's. That's a lot going. Yeah. Like, I remember we went from Baldwin to Chesterfield and we kept Baldwin and it was like a big dramatic moment of like, how are we going to do two locations? Yeah. That's a lot of locations. Yeah. But in reality, it's three like three almost two. broke me. Three was, <laughs> it took me a couple of years to come back from that. But how do you cultivate that community? Sorry. How do you cultivate that community um, with all those locations? Because people are all over the city. And like, even though you're in a city, the same city, there, there's there can be a lot of breakdown there yeah you know it a, a lot of it falls on me and like just my time and where i can mm. be and who i can touch every every conversation i have is an opportunity to promote the brand and the, the product and mm -hmm. make an impact and i think we're pretty involved with the community i mean through our like events but then also through our philanthropy we do a lot you know with the mm -hmm. st louis food bank um we have a charity um in north county the north county that we support and you know we provide them education as well as food and we have a couple other ones that we we partner with as well but it's just it's just time you know o over the years is just making sure as we grow our philanthropy and our our extracurricular stuff grows and so i think a lot of it has to do with the people that work at the business too sure. like you know helping support them on their interests as well and getting them involved with the community so it's just it's taking time it's had to be a focus because if you don't focus on it it can totally not not be a thing and it's it's definitely been a focus for us i want fit flavors to be a brand i wanted it to be a local lifestyle brand that people felt like Fit Flavors is a part of my lifestyle. And it's almost like wearing the Nike swoosh, you know, mm -hmm. like you're proud, you're like I wear Nike. It's kind of mm -hmm. like I eat Fit Flavors, you know, like I care about quality. I care about my health. Because yeah, I feel like a lot of people, they, there's a lot of things that they buy, but they don't feel connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just through all all the times I'm speaking and being out in the community, it's all the ways that we can touch people or at the events that we're at and giving out free products and stuff and just getting our products in people's hands and making impact with the people that we partner with yeah because I, I i think about like people that are in corporate 500 and they're like sometimes they probably don't feel connected like my wife's going we went through that where yeah she'd be with one company and she absolutely loved it because everyone's connected everyone has that community but then she goes to a different company and it's like total are you talking about internally or externally with the community um internally internally with the so, so that that's what i wanted to get at too, oh i'm is, sorry no, but I, I think that was a perfect answer on the on the external but like so internal it, because I th there's a lot of uh, you know the dads are in corporate 500 and they also coach tiger teams so i think it's it's kind of cool having that cross section between we just talked about how um you've just connected the team together how can someone do that internally inside of a business or inside of a team where they feel a little bit more connected how can they do with so like because you you have a business you have five locations you're going it's on time your it's yeah. just yeah. it's time so and you're intent invest, you're investing into the and people. intent it's it's what are you visualizing and like how do you bring it to fruition and understand like this does not happen overnight like it takes time like i just look at my business and how it's ebbed and flowed over the years it's grown and it's i've definitely gone through some hard times i've had turnover and stuff like that and it's like how do i get the employees to buy in how do i get people to opt in you got to create opportunities for them and make it fun for them and give back to them and invest in them so like I just think one of the things i mean she built a culture committee at our company <coughs> oh no way so this That's is a cool. committee yeah. of typically non-managers yes they have but to be. employees that want to have a voice and be a voice from every department company, and they need to bring ideas to the committee and We'll do barbecues. We're going to do a company Olympic Day this year. That's cool. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> he's he's going to MC. Yeah. Well, and two, yeah. it's like um, 
you know, what, what is going to, they're bringing ideas to us. So sure. now it's not all on me now. Now I'm putting it back in their hands. All right, you guys want to create this culture. What do you want to create? You know? Yeah. And so getting them, them more involved has created more buy-in and then they've put kind of pushed it out and throughout. Managers get to choose an event per quarter to do with their staff and company so it's almost picks like it up. You release control a little totally. bit. Totally. You got to give, done. you got to give back. Yeah. You got to, you got to incentivize them to buy in. So I think when people have take full ownership of whatever they're in, there's more buy-in. So you got to give them some ownership to take. So if they can take ownership of being on that committee, there's more buy-in. Which then goes back to what he did with his players, which yeah, is like the, the, the six players, with, hey, this is your yeah. team. This is, you got to make sure that everyone feels included. You almost created your it's own It's actually cult. one of our cool, core values is take full ownership. That's, That's awesome. cool. Yeah. You created your own culture committee inside mm-hmm. your team. Yeah. <laughs> Teaches them. Gives them accountability. It's all relative. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Team same, sports, same business. Thing, it's all yeah. the same. Yeah. I mean, because they're, they're nine years old, they're going to have to learn at some point. Sure. And that's a huge advantage when you are nine years old and you're already learning that. I, these I, guys were tight. They were playing together for four or five years already. Like, they're thick as thieves. I gotta got to give these, him props, too. You know? Like, another thing I've... So, <laughs> I will say, when we came out after the first year, I was really impressed with him as a coach. I didn't think he was going to be that good. <laughs> <laughs> I just... We're going to have coach reviews. He's so, <laughs> he's so, like, kind and patient. I just didn't think he was going to be like... You know, like, but he was. I was like, oh my God, you're so good with these kids. Yeah. And like, I was actually the one who was like, I couldn't speak. Like, I was just like annoyed that I'd have to keep saying the same thing over again. So I'm just the dummy out there at practice. I'll shag balls, I'll hit balls, I'll do whatever. Yeah. Where do you need me, coach? You know, and it's like watching him lead these kids, but then also like turning them into good people. Mm-hmm. Like, we, we have no, no, he has like no tolerance for when they act a certain way or if if they act up he's he's had offline discussions with parents and kids outside of practice you know and about their character and i've just been so impressed because i'm like these are the things that you are like doing that are going to make them good humans he takes so much ownership in it how are those conversations go when you talk about character with the other parents like if, if you have an issue with a player's character how do you approach that I, I've never thought about it that way, but like, how yeah. do you approach that? Um, I mean, every conversation I've ever had to have was accepted with open arms. Totally. And I think that's, you know, we earned their respect over the past couple of years to know, they know our intentions are in the right spot and they know we probably see things on the field that they don't see. And once again, we've gotten really lucky with the group of parents that we have where they're like, dude, I want my kid to be a better human, you know, that's not awesome. just a better baseball player. And I, I constantly talk about, you know, creating captains over MVPs, right? Like, I don't think our job coaching eight and nine you is to create the next Derek Jeter. Sorry, I'm a Yankee fan. Um, <laughs> you know, that's another coach's job down the road. Like, I would feel that we did our job as coaches that when we, we hand these kids off at 14 to either a Tigers coach or a high school or college, like, that coach looks at that kid and says, somebody got their teeth into this mm-hmm. kid and did a really good job. Like, good humans, respectful, hard worker, takes care of their stuff, and then they're ready for the next level of development. That's but where I think a lot of coaches get it wrong. That's, they, view, they view it as a skill I they want a team a, of captains at this age over MVPs. Like, I want them, like you point, like, your boy strikes out, like, pick him up when he comes in a sure. dugout, right? Yeah, like, and I heard, like, so many kids are dropping out of baseball yeah. when they're older, and, like, because it's not fun or it's too much. So it's, like, we, we, we're trying to find a healthy balance because, like, we're extremely competitive people, but at the same time, we're, like, it's the long game. Like, we want these boys playing in high school. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's got to be fun. It can't be too overbearing. So it's, like, how do you find that healthy balance? Yeah, like, Project Play. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Um, it's at, by Aspen Institute, and they have a committee every year that – visits in i think it's denver mm-hmm. it's denver mm-hmm. and like they show that baseball peaks at 12 and 13 and then when it gets to 14 like and 15 cliff. and then just went <laughs> really is that like yeah. sophomore year uh, freshman sophomore yeah. year i mean you're is gonna where you peak yeah it's like where, no where, you peak at 12 you peak okay at 12. So eighth peak grade the, the peak uh sixth grade sixth grade yeah. Yeah. sorry yep. you're good Off. you're good no you peak at you peak at 12 and then uh, whether it's other opportunities or other things that are drawing your attention or just the overall demand or well, the experience. Other things that are your attention like girls. Yeah. <laughs> the, I, I think that's just, the girl index, right? There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. So something we always talk about is it's not only game adoption, but keeping kids involved in the game with this through experience, what you're talking about. And I yeah. think where, where you're going about it in a really great way is, is it's more than baseball. Yeah. It's more than baseball. Yeah. And sports, you know, sports have taught me so many things that are applying to my life today that if I wasn't involved in sports, totally. I don't know where 
totally. that would have been. And that yeah. wasn't what I learned on the field necessarily, but maybe in a practice setting or, or a backyard, you know, play around with the team and things of that nature. That That's what a lot of it's about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we that, talk a lot about the, the fine line between having fun and like goofing off and being disrespectful. Sure. Like, talks about that all the time. <laughs> that, that for me is like a hard line. You know, I want mm -hmm. you to have as much fun, but mm -hmm. don't pour dirt down your friends back on <laughs> Yeah, not, That's not fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? So 100%. Yeah. Um, and failure too. I mean, I mean, you guys know, right? This, this game's a game of dealing with failure, right? And there's a lot of transferable knowledge from baseball. And we've had in business, like, best baseball players in the world sit, fail seven out of 10 times, mm -hmm. right? And they get paid buku contracts, right? Mm -hmm. and people look at her business and be like, oh, you were successful. I'm like, yeah, you don't, you don't. No, you so don't really didn't see so many dark, the so the dark the days. And, you know, I, like, you know, once again, we're only at the nine, nine U level, but these kids have such high expectations of themselves, yeah. which is great. Yep. And I think some of that is kind of manufactured by social media and the For access sure. to like YouTube. Like they don't go online and watch errors made by Tatis. They yeah. go watch Tatis's top 100 plays, right? And then they get in their mind that like, they should never make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And we saw last year, like first year kid pitch, like we had some kids that threw absolute gems for nine years old, but they gave up four runs one inning. And it's like their world is coming to an end. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you just pitched three innings and gave up four runs at nine years old. Like. You're good, man. Yeah. Trust yeah. me, you're good. Yeah, you know? Exactly. And I just think some of that, you got to be careful with that, you know, the electronics and stuff like that. It's it's tough to monitor. Um, I, I keep on mentioning this <laughs> Netflix documentary. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Breakpoint. It's about tennis. And they actually take you through not just the highlights, but like the struggles of these one through 150 mm. and how cool. much of a struggle it is to actually like, you're going to choke. It's going to happen. Sure. You're still ranked number 10 in the world, but yeah. you're going to suck at some point. Yeah. Mm. It's just how you're going to handle it. You're going to throw your racket. Yeah. You're going to pout. You're going to put the towel over your head. If you do, then how do you actually respond back from that? Which at nine years old and 10 years old is such a huge advantage when then you get into the workforce or whatever you get into or even if you start a business, because then you know, like, oh, I'm in the grinding mode. This is gonna, mm. this is gonna suck sure. for like three, four months, and I just have to keep grinding. Mm. I, 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 and that's what that's what sucks about when it gets to 13 and 14. Kids think that it's all over, and oh, I just, I, I didn't cut it. I'm not gonna make major league baseball. I'm not gonna make college baseball. Why even try? Mm. It's like, man, I would, I would play just because. That's mm -hmm. I, I, I was one of those guys that I just wanted to play. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I feel like we're thinking that Major League Baseball is the goal or college baseball is the goal. That's not necessarily the goal. Sure. That's just that's just part of the journey. Yeah. And I think like Agreed. we just as coaches, we kind of put too much admiration in like the elite level mm. or the elite status. Like, oh, if you're not going to be a college player, then I'm not going to work with you. Like, I just think that's just mm. crap. So um, parents got to be careful with that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Which is tough. Cause yeah. again, like in the informational age highlights, TikTok, Instagram, it's all the good stuff. It's all the good stuff. The good like stuff. sports center, top, top 10. Now you have it 24 seven. And yeah. now you have it down. We were talking about this in the last episode. You have it all the way down to like Snapchat and Instagram where it's like the kids now high school ages where you can see the not top 10 of the high school kids that had like a flop on the court or they had a slam dunk on the court. Now it's like, well, if that guy's doing it, then why even try, mm -hmm. you know, wow. which is tough. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think a lot of parents realize like that phone is actually destroying them actually going out and playing the Jeez. game. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. I agree. Have you ever I seen agree. the movie social dilemma? Social dilemma? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. You have? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. It's creepy. Mm -hmm. it's, super creepy. it's very creepy. It. Yeah, it's, it's exactly what you're talking about. Oh, really? So, I didn't yeah. Even yeah, yeah, it's yeah. actually yeah. it's but actually like a bunch of big wigs that left like Google and Apple yeah. and Facebook, and, stuff, Facebook yeah. and they're talking about like the psych the psychology. Yeah. How they go attack your insecurities and everything. They can everything. figure they can figure everything out. Just watch it, yeah. Riker, You would like it. Yeah. Oh God, that that's just gonna make me feel like so bad about the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna make you put your phone down. Oh man. Um. What is one thing in youth sports uh, that's most needed that you think right now that you guys have just entered in, you, know, you started your teams and now you're, you've seen it on the parent side. Now you're, you're on the coaching side. What, what's one thing that's needed in youth sports um, that cause like club directors, we think yeah. we have an idea, but again, like Dave said, 
We're yeah. not coaching youth teams, uh, so we don't know. I think the electronics are a big battle. I think really limiting. We had two teams for a while. I was coaching my, my, my younger kids team for a while. So we had 24 kids every week. I could tell you without a question which kids were numbed on electronics mm -hmm. and which were not. So I think you're battling for attention, right? Because those electronics are like super stimulating, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think parents need to chill a little too. I saw an awesome video meme yesterday. <laughs> Mom's cooking breakfast. Kid comes downstairs, probably 10 years old. Mom, you're not cracking the egg right. You got to crack it this way. And she's looking at him. And he's like, you're holding the pan on the wrong angle and your flame's up too high. And she's like, I, what are you doing? Like, I know how to cook eggs. He goes, now you know how I feel at home plate. Oh. Whoa. Damn. Wow. Oh, that that's like, good. That's... Oh. Damn. <sighs> damn. I'm going to seal that one. And she just way. looks at him and he just looks at her and he walks away. <clears throat> I, I read a so. book. I read a book. Um, it was called um, With Winning in Mind, and um, it's written by a Olympic gold medalist. Yeah. And he, he, he's his whole thing is about, like, mental game and, like, how he trains uh, professional athletes and uh, Olympic athletes now on the conscious mind, subconscious mind, and self-image. Mm -hmm. And he, he was talking big on that in the book and how – Parents just need to shut up in games and not say anything. And I'm like, damn, not even cheer him on. He's like, you shouldn't say anything because you just your kid hears you and it just gives them something that doesn't mm -hmm. make them feel what they should feel if they if you weren't there. And I was like, wow. I think parents need to reengage with their kids a little bit. Like me and my boy, we play catch every single day. And we got a guy that walks his walks his dog, and he's been seeing us for five years every day. And he said to me one day, he goes, I, I walk miles every day of my dog through this neighborhood. He goes, I don't see anybody ever out here doing this. Like, you do pitching lessons, right? Yep. Like, why do parents think sending a kid to you for an hour a week for pitching lessons and doing nothing at home is going to serve them any good? Correct. Like, whether you're good at baseball or not at home, just being a rebounder and someone to throw the ball to, like, just get outside and play with your kids. 100%. Get off the electronics and just go outside. And you don't got to be good at baseball. Mm -mm. It's a really you good point. Gotta, you just got to be play there with it. your kid. Mm -hmm. Like the kids that are excelling are the ones that are getting reps and playing at home. And it's good for the family relationship. It gets the kids off the electronics. And frankly, listen, this is a tough sport to get good at, right? Like you can go run around a soccer field and like look busy, right? Yeah. And yeah. not play soccer, but like you can't stand at home plate and not look like you play baseball or look like you play baseball. Like it's a really like individual type effort. And I think, if you just give your kid reps at home, they're going to get better. And the better you are at something, the more likely you are to enjoy it, the more likely you enjoy it, the more likely you are to stay with it. And I think that starts now. One of my friends who I played with, he, he just joined the Tigers. Um, he's down in New Mexico. And he has a rule, analog life. And what so is it? It's called analog life. And his kids have to live an analog lifestyle. So they don't have any digital stuff. Oh, mm. Analog. analog analog life i've never yeah. heard that word before. yeah so like it's just like um they can't have screens they can't have any of that it's just that they have to be outside playing they're probably yeah. going to be so much more socially mm -hmm. um advanced just because the conversations they're having with their parents on a regular basis you know 100 percent because they're not numbed out on like the screen. Yeah. It, it's balanced right listen <laughs> there is some good we talked about it before like yeah these kids baseball iqs is greater because they get to watch Plays we watch Vinny's IQ but drastically go up it's a over fine the winter line, from just watching you know? all of the YouTube clips. He knows all the equipment. Yeah, he sure. knows all the teams. He yeah. knows all the players. He'd be like, oh, yeah, he was drafted last week. I'm mm -hmm. like, how do you know <laughs> this? You got to get outside and play with your kids. All the balance. Bottom line, bottom line <laughs> yeah. you got to go outside and play with them. I would say all the players now are probably way more skilled and better than I was. Mm -hmm. um, the drills are also playing. way better. Yeah, I follow some better. of these people on yeah. Instagram. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, sure. why wasn't I doing this stuff? Nobody yeah. was doing oh. this with me. Yep. Yeah. My dad was content. hitting me golf yeah. balls. Yeah. He's <laughs> Yeah, I got a whole story on that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you dive into that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would take me with a painter's bucket with a bunch of golf balls, and he would – he Sometimes you make me get down on my knees and he would say, if you can catch a golf ball, you can catch a softball. <laughs> he would hit him at me, I swear. And I had a black mouth guard. I played third base. He caught it the hot box. So he's like, you got to be ready for that shit, Jillian. And, uh, oh, no then, way. Then, then, he would, uh, then he would pitch him at me underhand and he'd like, maybe drag bun, slap bun, switch hit, slap hit, everything. 
that's I was the number two. What, that's more extreme than what my dad did. He was like, all right, go out there. You're not going to have a glove and hit your ground balls. <laughs> uh, but that, I feel like that's a little bit more extreme than what he did. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. But, it, but, it, but it probably made you pretty good. I got, I got, I, I actually really liked it after a while because I realized I was getting better than people. Mm-hmm. I made varsity my yeah, freshman year. For like, sure. Yeah. Just stuff like that. And then it just made me want to practice more. That's yeah. cool. I think that's that's one thing that a lot of people are missing too is the creativity side, coaching creativity. We talked about that with Devin Morgan. Mm-hmm. Um, like a lot of kids don't realize like, yeah, it's cold outside, but you can probably go to any field and take ground balls. Mm. Like it doesn't have to be yeah. this baseball field. It just mm-hmm. has to be a field. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then you just need a baseball and a bat. Yeah. Like a lot of kids don't realize like back in the Civil War, they would gr- they would have their bats and gloves with them when they were walking to their next route and then they would probably play a game on just a random field. And a lot of kids think, oh, we have to have a baseball field. We have to have a facility. No, you, wow. you don't. Just yeah. just figure out a way. Like there's a there's a cool account um, on Instagram. It's this Jap- former Japanese player and he's teaching kids how to field and they're out there in the cold in the winter and actually taking ground balls and these kids are absolutely loving it. And like it's on frozen ground and everything. They and don't just, care that it's cold. They, they, don't, they, don't, they, they don't, don't care. They don't care. No. You care. They don't yeah, care. Yeah, they don't care. Yeah, they don't care. If yeah. you make it seem like it's the best thing in the world, they'll be like, oh, yeah, this is fun. Yeah. This is awesome. Give me another ground ball. Yeah. So, guys, um, this has been an awesome conversation. I Thanks. appreciate your guys' time. Um, no, thank you. Dave, you got anything else that you want to ask? No, it was awesome. I mean, a lot of tons, tons of insight on my side from the nutrition side to just, I mean, the, the way that you're building a community around your team and the culture that's, that's so needed. And it, it's going to just, it's a, it's the experience level, right? That okay. those kids are just absolutely loving every aspect of there's so much more than just playing the game, mm-hmm. which I love that you're doing that. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, where can they follow you? I'm just Jillian Tedesco on Instagram, Fit Flavors, and my business is Fit underscore Flavors underscore STL on yeah. Instagram. So if you're in St. Louis, make sure you come over and grab a Fit Flavors. Oh, yeah. Well. Check us out on the website. It's www.fit-flavors.com. Yep. Thank Jason, you. Jason, did they, you want to follow you? Or are you, nah, you, you I don't know. Follow her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, you can follow me at Spiker Helms on Twitter. You can follow Dave at David underscore Berkby. Mm-hmm. Um, we will catch you in the next episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you.